Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hi, and welcome to Reloscope, the Relationship Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm Marie Stella, your host from Melbourne, Australia. Let's start the show. Welcome back to Reloscope, the Relationship Science Insights Podcast. Gender stereotypes are such a vast and ever-changing phenomenon. Why do they exist? What role do they play in relationships? Is there a need to question them? And what can be changed? All these questions will be answered in today's episode with the expert knowledge of clinical psychologist, Dr. Katharina Ponte. She has been running her own practice for over 30 years and works primarily with couples. Hi, Katharine. It's lovely oh, having you hi, on Marie. the show. Hi. Thank How- Yes. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thanks. I'm glad to be here. That's amazing. I'm so glad you're here as well. I'm really looking forward to hearing your perspective on this um, because as someone who's witnessed an abundance of such interactions, I imagine it must be interesting. Um, so tell us a bit about your background and how you got started in this. Um. I got interested in psychology, uh, kind of following my husband, who's also a psychologist. I had started out in another career, but really felt that I wanted to uh, move into psychology. So we ended up going to graduate school, and uh, we both moved to Louisville, Kentucky here. And my husband was on the faculty at the university, and I started a private practice. And... uh, sort of by coincidence early in my practice, I got referred to two different couples and uh, worked very effectively with them. And that's the way sometimes a practice gets shaped. It's just by serendipity um, because I had started a general practice. And uh, just over the years, because I was in fact working with couples, that of course became a uh, an important area that I had to do research and learning and taking coursework and becoming, um, uh, becoming, uh, I, I don't always like to call myself an expert, but becoming knowledgeable about it to be able to be helpful and also to not only help just the people that I saw, because as a clinical psychologist over the course of your career, you don't see an awful lot of people, but to also uh, reach out to other people. And I was able to do that in the last few years by writing a book on uh, a, a marriage of equals. Uh, and also that led me to uh, start writing a blog. I got invited to write a, a blog on a marriage of equals for the Psychology Today magazine, which is a very popular magazine. And that's just given me wonderful access to a large number of people. That's... And then and that gets me to, to opportunities like today. That's such a delightful story. And I have to say, you are so humble and modest about it. Um, I've read some of your work just before this. And I just, I I, I really like the way you think. And I, I yeah. Um, so I'm really excited to interview you. Um, but before we get started on this and get carried away, um, we'd like to get to know you better. Um, this is Have You Met Katharina Ponte? Um so I'm just going to ask you a few questions about your favorite forms of media and stuff like that. And you can answer as short as, or as long as you want. Um, what's your favorite book? My favorite book is my book. <laughs> I love that self-promotion. You can't see it. Yeah. Oh, it, it reverses. <laughs> no, seriously. It was a, a wonderful experience writing it. Uh, one of the things that was interesting to me was I was very leery about having an editor, and it turned out that uh, that editor was a, a wonderful asset to have in in making my work more accessible to lay people. 
you know, when you go through PhD and doctoral programs, you get very academically oriented and you think academically and you think intellectually and you write for academics. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to write for everyday people. And, um, and so uh, that's, that is my favorite book. <laughs> I love that so much because I feel like you're one of the rare examples that like if you put in this much into your art and you are your own biggest fan, it's just it's just so gratifying and rewarding Absolutely. and you're just unapologetically proud of your art, right. which is fantastic to hear. And I will take you, if you read a little bit of my stuff, I really take sometimes a different view than than is more typical about about how couples, how people get along in marriages. I'm very interested in the dynamics of people in marriages. Absolutely. And, and I'm going to use the term marriage, but I'm really talking about and I'm interested in uh, couples in committed relationships. Uh, and there are many ways to form committed relationships without necessarily being married. Uh, but I... And I and I, I think that's a wonderful thing. I don't think it should be. I think we should be able to be open to a different kinds of relationships. Yeah, it's actually it's also getting more popular these days to have a life partner that you're not necessarily married to. Um, so that's it's nice for you know various situations. Um, so what's your favorite movie? Well, <laughs> I. I don't go to many movies anymore, not since the pandemic, but I, like most people here in the United States anyway, is we do lots of streaming. And I must tell you that my husband and I subscribe to Acorn Service, which in fact provides us with all the British mysteries we want, and also those from New Zealand and Australia. I, there's a wonderful, fun New Zealand, New Zealand a series called The Broken Wood Mysteries that Joe and I love. That's, so, uh, yeah, what and, is it about? It sounds very interesting. It's a it's about this uh it's one of those one of those uh series like wonderful series which is a group of people an ensemble of characters. And there's the one detective and then the people who work for him. And then not only do I meet interesting people that are stars of the shows but then you get to meet some of the really all of the people that live in New Zealand and those that live in new in um in Australia and particularly some of the indigenous people we're very interested in having that experience so we just love those programs that sounds great uh i maybe should look this movie up or the broken is, mysteries is just yeah. great fun it sounds really really great it sounds right up my alley um Good. Do you, it's <laughs> kind of light too it's not i mean there's always some mystery going on and oftentimes some murder but it's also light and just wonderful characters yeah that sounds great i wonder if acorn is available in australia i have no idea I, I well, don't... you should be able to get it on the internet. I mean, I, you should. I mean, uh, not the internet. Uh, I, I don't know. I would. I hope you can. Yeah, I'll, you I'll can. look it up. I'll, I'll figure it out after this. <laughs> Do you have a favorite podcast? Oh, <laughs> I don't do a lot of podcasts. I read more than I watch what podcasts. Fair enough, and no pressure to say out. No pressure to say Relescope at all. When when we do when I do podcasts, it's oftentimes about political things. I'm very interested in politics here in the United States and what's going on here, and actually what's going on uh, all over the world. I I just was so impressed with your. I don't know her name, but your female prime minister. And her speeches and her going, uh, the speech she left when she resigned, it just so moved. She was such a wonderful person and such a moving person. Um, yeah, I agree with you there. And uh, so I, I, I listen to, if I listen to a podcast, it's going to be about foreign policy or it's going to be about politics, local politics here. So would you consider her your famous role model? She is a brilliant role model for all of us. I, that's an excellent suggestion. I just, she's wonderful. And she, when she spoke, she was not afraid to speak from the heart. She, you know, she didn't speak in any staid fashion and she just talked emotionally and beautifully. It was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, that's always nice to hear. Um, is there a course that you've completed recently or a favorite one of yours in the past? 
Uh, yes, I had a in graduate school. It was an amazing experience. It was a one of my first courses when I entered graduate school. I graduated from Duke University here in the United States. And uh, it was one of my first courses. It was this personality course. It was nothing like what I expected it to be. It was a, it was a course that essentially taught us to look at personality through understanding metaphysics, if you can believe that. But it was one of those life courses, which I've had about three in my educational experiences, which absolutely changed your thinking around completely and opened up such a brilliant way of looking at the world and looking at uh, how to think about the world and how to think about theories that it just absolutely changed my life. So it introduced me to one of my favorite books, and this is so esoteric. I am so sorry for this. World Hypotheses. <laughs> well, of course, what? like, don't say sorry at all. Uh, what's, <laughs> what's the biggest thing you've learned from that course? I learned from that course how, a couple of interesting things. One is it was a brilliant way to analyze different psychological theories so that you could really understand what uh, they were trying to argue about human nature. And then the other kind of general thing is that uh, there are uh, how to, to think about theories in terms of what their basic view of the fundamental view of, the, of nature and the world is. So it gave me a very in-depth way of looking at theories. And I'm, I was, I'm extraordinarily grateful for that. And I think it's, I think it has enhanced my own thinking in my field and therefore being able to be better of help to people, I think. That sounds amazing. I do love anything that makes me question the way I perceive things. It's always very eye-opening. Um, <laughs> cool. So we've got to know a little bit about you. Um, that was very interesting. But we are going to get into the, the nitty-gritty of stereotypes in relationships now. Um, first question that we always ask is, how would you define a relationship? Well, I think formally speaking, a relationship uh, simply is a way that people, probably we think of it as two people, but it doesn't have to be, two people, how they connect interpersonally. And of course, I'm interested in intimate relationships uh, of two people, how, they inter how they're connected interpersonally. And uh, I'm interested in people who are committed to each other. And I'm also interested in uh, heterosexual couples, not because of any limitation in my uh, acceptance of whatever form of uh, coupleship that people want to engage in, but it's heterosexual couples where you have the gender challenges. They're not the same in same-sex couples. They don't have to adhere to the same gender stereotypes that we get stuck with in heterosexual couples. That's absolutely true. I do see the difference between like my past heterosexual relationships versus friends who are in same-sex relationships. It's just very, very different. It's not, and, it's not limited in the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in your opinion, does a relationship still hold the same meaning, structure and importance as decades ago? That's a, a brilliant question to ask me. It just opens up almost everything I want to say today. <laughs> uh, I'm going to introduce you to a uh, professor, a professor of psychology, management, and organization at Northwestern University, which is a very nice university that's near Chicago, Illinois. And this professor, his name is Eli Finkel, and he and his colleagues in their work described three errors of marriage uh, over the past two, probably 250 years that will help us to understand the ways in which marriage is different and the way it's the same. And those three errors are, what well, he's called them the institutional error, the uh, companionate error, and the self-expressive error. Now, the uh, institutional error occurred, according to Fink and, Finkel and his associates, uh, from the mid-1700s to the mid-1800s. And in those are the times, and it's very important to, to contrast these kinds, that kind of error with later ones, we lived in agrarian society, and marriage was essentially the economic unit of our society. Uh, people lived together, they procreated, they clothed themselves, they fed themselves. They were a contained unit in the society themselves. 
And it's not clear that there was much emphasis on the quality of relationships, which is where our head is now, is our, the, what is the quality of our relationship? And gender was certainly not a focus like it is today. And subsequently, even to their time, everybody worked and contributed to the well-being of the family. Nobody was stuck in, in uh, what I would consider to be rigid rules about who did what and when. The uh, companionate era, which is probably the forerunner of what we think of as our era now, of, of marriage now, came is about from the mid-1800s to the mid-1900s, and it came along with the Industrial Revolution. And it's uh, very important to understand how this affected men and women in marriage. The agrarian society was replaced by a new social, a whole new social and economic order that was defined by industrial capitalism, as a matter of fact. Um, and two things, two significant things happened. One separated the sexes into different silos of responsibility. Men were at work and women were home. Before that, that was not the case. Uh, and it brought about the efficient, the theory of the efficient market. And this was based on the idea that everyone operates in their own self-interest. And about this same time, evolutionary theory was being created, born, introduced. And uh, that is another whole area, significant area of the world which promoted self-interest is our primary, if not our only, motivation. So economically speaking then, in marriage, men became breadwinners outside the home. Women became homemakers who supported breadwinners. Interpersonally, because it wasn't the economic any unit anymore, marriage became more about companionship, hence what Finkel decides to call the companionary era, and I think it's a good, a good name. They, we love and care about each other during this time, and also I think there's an in beginning emphasis on passion. Um, however, from my perspective, I mean, not from my perspective, but the thing that is significant historically that we understand that this is where our current idea, many of our current ideas came from, these marital qualities were defined in terms of gender characteristics. Women showed love by being supportive, caretaking, sexually available, and virtuous. Women got assigned virtue because men went out into the cruel, cruel, competitive world where virtue was not much, much admired, or not that it wasn't admired, but that it was not a part of the competition. Uh, husbands showed love by being good financial uh, providers. Uh, by the way, the, the another reason why women were, I think, assigned and, and became the virtuous ones is because this cold, hard, cruel world that the men had to go out to work in, their safety and their, their sanctuary from that kind of world was the home. The home became this their sanctuary where virtue could prevail. Sorry if uh, I'm getting this correctly. Yeah. Um, does that mean that essentially to begin with, there weren't any distinct roles and we basically just made it up as time went along? We, it got created because when industry came and displaced agriculture, we separated, men and women weren't separated before, we put men into the world of business and industry and we put women at home. So, and, and as we'll talk about in a little bit more about, that's when we started even talking about masculine and feminine. You didn't talk about, you didn't use, you didn't care, have to characterize men and women like that. So it, it, it is important as we go along to and really delve into this gender stereotypy that the way we see things was constructed by the way the industry and the economy was organized and also by, we'll come to understand by how evolutionary theory promoted the idea that self-interest is our basic motive. Mm -hmm. And now that men and the women, next, sorry, yes. Oh, go ahead. Oh, so now that men and women are, are back together, because like both men and women, well, not yet, but now that, you know, we 
it's not as like separated as it was before. Do you see that as like, well, th- this direction that we're going in is like we're going back to how it originally started? And well, you're not going to go back to you're not going to go back to an agrarian society. So it's going to have to be a different kind of thing. And there's some other kinds of things that evolve beyond just the separation of the sexes. So let me continue with this third era, sure. which yes. will help us because we're it's it's going to actually what's going to happen, uh, Marie, is it's going to unfold. And it's a very interesting unfolding. And, and where we're going to end up, I think, a little bit, at least if I have my way about it, is where we have to begin to think about doing things differently in marriage. So that's where I'm leading you. That's where I'd like to go. The self-expressive era began, according to Finkel and his associates, probably in the mid-1900s, and uh, from 1965, uh, for another about 100, uh, not, I'm sorry, not about 100, about 1965, and what he thinks we're still living under. Uh, and I think if we think back to that period of time in the mid-1900s, that's the era of the civil rights movement, the counterculture movement, and then a little later into the 60s and 70s, the feminist movement. And out of this whole thinking of the way people were um, engaging with each other, people began to want more than companionship. Uh, we wanted to be valued as individuals. We wanted to be able to express ourselves. I think hence why Finkel calls it the self-expressive era. And I think his his characterization of these eras is really very helpful to us in understanding where we are now and 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 the necessity perhaps to grow out of where we've been. Um, to express ourselves, uh, we wanted to achieve personal growth. Another very interesting thing from a psychological point of view is this was the era of the humanistic movement in psychology and uh, known mostly for the idea of self-actualization. So again, this real emphasis on the self and self-actualization. And I think Finkel gave us uh, those perspectives too, on these two very important trends that began. Marriage got organized around gender, and it got organized around the self-interest of people. Um, and if we think about it, as you've just pointed out, uh, I think now over these, uh, where we're sort of still in this era, gender organization and gender rigidity, as you pointed out, is not as firm as it was. I think there's been some significant movement, not enough from my perspective. I think we need more work on that. But also, uh, but I do think in contrast to that, the organization around relationship that as self inch or I think the, we're beginning to increase the idea that our own individual self-interest should take on more import than it has. And I think that may be leading us down a wrong path. So what, um, how do you define emotional intimacy? I think emotional intimacy is an interesting concept, which is why I wanted to stick with what you had asked about this, because it's an interesting concept. I think it really is emphasizing the uh, what we've began to see in this companionate area, the, the importance of closeness in marriage and relationships. Um, and I think it also, um, uh, that closeness, uh, emotional in- intimacy, I think also began to, sh- to emphasize self-expression. Uh, so the importance of individual closeness and the importance of our ability to express ourselves in that connection with each other. But uh, emotional intimacy, we probably ought not to think of it as a static thing, but as a process. It's a relationship process. And it's a, a process that can be defined by, say, my, say, for example, my husband comes home and he wants to talk to me about something difficult situation that happened at work. And it is my, and I'm going to turn and attend to him and listen, I'm going to say something to the effect of, tell me more about that or what's going on. And when, and so what you're doing in that case, what he's doing is self-disclosing and what I'm doing is listening and attending. And when you, and it's that process that then we'll continue on because we'll have a nice conversation about that. And as we have that nice conversation, that emotional intimacy 
continues. And when you're self-disclosing, you're talking usually about like some situation that is problematic for you. You might talk about a personal history of yours. You know, sometimes it's a good time. It's, it's important for each of us, as, for us as couples, to know about each other's uh, histories. You know, some of the untoward things happen that happen to us. Say, for example, abuse experience, uh, traumatic experiences, even past relations. And the important thing for the partner in that is to listen, to attend, to tell me about it, tell, let me hear more about it. Or sometimes you can reflect back uh, your understanding of what's, what is being said. So, for example, Joe say, maybe said, I felt really uh, uncomfortable about when so-and-so said something to me. And I might say something to him that says, um, did, 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 were you feeling a little bit anxious about that? So I'll stay pretty close to what he's saying. And above all, when you're attending and responding, you are not making judgments and you're not giving advice. So I think this is also, this kind of emotional intimacy, which is important, uh, does a couple of things. One is it, it really develops the companionship in the relationship, but it also helps you uh, become committed to the well-being of each other. So I think that's just an it's extraordinarily important that dynamic as a part of a, a relationship, a marriage rela a relationship is very important. That's interesting because it doesn't sound um, gendered at all. So what do gender roles and expectations look like in romantic relationships these days? Well, it's very interesting. I mean, it's good. It's good for us to talk about this. You know, by the way, a lot has changed in terms of gender roles, and I'm, this is where I'm going to come back to what you asked me before: is how has it changed? I think it's changed in the public arena since the since the feminist movement. You know, there are lots of good things that are going on in public life uh, that that are challenging gender particularly in work life, to this challenging gender, these rigid gender roles. But it's not true as marriage. Uh, we still do gender and marriage. I think gender, doing gender is really the hallmark of what Finkel calls the companion at marriage. Uh, by the way, do it, when you're doing gender, it refers to the idea that when you do household tasks, it's as much about affirming masculinity and femininity as it's doing the task um uh when, let's let's explore that a little bit if you'd like um living yes, together please. okay living together <laughs> means doing household tasks having and taking care of children and providing for the emotional well-being of the family members uh, loving and caring about people and family, as we talked about, which became increasingly important during the companionate era. So let me give you an example of what that might look like. A husband, not mine because he knows better, but... <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you've got a good one. We have a wonderful relationship. We really do. That's why I recommend marriage. I'm very biased. Uh, a husband comes home from work and uh, he, he single signals that he needs some attention by plopping down into his favorite chair. He doesn't, he doesn't say anything, right? He just plops down. His wife picks up the cue and how she responds will depend upon how it feels, what to her feels being feminine. Does she bring him a drink? Does she bring him some food? She's probably not gonna try and talk to him because she knows that's not what he expects or what now he wants to relate to her. Uh, now, if she doesn't do that, he is going to feel deprived of his due. That's a very, in that whole arena of caring, that's a, a perfect example of a gendered, and it's, and it's invisible. And you do it because of it. femininity and masculinity gets connected to it. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes. Gen femininity gets tied to these gender roles. And uh, if you don't do it, things don't, you will feel deprived. You will feel unha un unsatisfied. Um, I think also just to talk about household chores and childcare, uh, 
in marriages even today, gender still continues to be the strongest, strongest, strongest predictor of who does what, who how the tasks are allocated between husband and wife. And that's true even if women work outside the home. They continue to do most of the household chores. Uh, one recent thing I read is men do a little bit more and women do a little bit less, but not they're not significantly changed. Husbands are doing more child care now, which is absolutely terrific, but they're still not equal to women. Um, let, me, let me give you a couple of fun recent research findings. Husbands who run errands with their wives, not for them, reported greater sexual and marital satisfaction. So to any of the men that might be living, you know what to do. Uh, here, not living, who might be listening to our podcast. Uh, wives who did the majority of dishwashing were particularly unhappy in their marriage and reported the least sexual satisfaction. So I can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any... I don't think dishwashing um, gets anyone going. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. So, uh, but if you, if you, you know, you, the, the, and there's some, some interesting stuff, some argument was going around. There was an article that was written a number of years ago in one of the public magazines about if, if men do chore, if men do more in housework, they're less sexually satisfied. They don't get as much sex. Well, that's been debunked by other research, but one of the very difficult things about gender and gen and stereotypes of any kind, so but we're talking about gender stereotypes is once something like that that if you if you if men do more uh, uh, take on more responsibilities around the house, they get less sex. If that goes out in the public in the public arena, that no matter how much research is done, that then just shows that that is not accurate. It's not the same thing. A myth gets developed. Stereotypes about our myths about what men, men and women are like and how things in a marriage should be organized. And that really does need to change. And I think it's important to understand these are myths, uh, but they feel like they're truths. Uh, but one other kind of thing I want to talk about, about this companionate error where gender and self-interest became really uh, got organized is what organized our marriage it all it's it's the it is a perfect example of what we can now talk about today as a transactional relationship and i think we understand a little bit more what a transaction is in the united states we understand it a lot more because of what the political our political is life is telling us i, I cannot go into that a, uh, uh, a transaction is when a trouble, couple treats a marriage like a business deal. And that's what was set up in the companionship era. The breadwinner brings home the bacon. The homemaker cooks it, sets the table, feeds the children, washes the dishes while the breadwinner watches football. So there's a, the, the very structure of creating these silo of different responsibilities. There is no way... When it's not negotiation, which I want to talk about a little bit later on. It really is an exchange. You do this for me, and I do that for you. It's a transactional relationship, and it's it's not, from my perspective, and many other people who talk about who think about marriage understand that that is the way it's been structured, and we have to do some changes about those. Speaking about that. We can go on to talk about, if you'd like, the challenges faced by those who want to break free from these gender yes. stereotypes. I was going to ask that. <laughs> yeah. So I thought, what... perhaps, I thought perhaps you were. <laughs> <laughs> what are the challenges faced by individuals who want to challenge the traditional gender roles within their okay. relationships? I think there are three. I'd like to mention three things. There are more, but I'd like to mention three. One is... Uh, we have to continue to fight for family friendly family workplaces. Uh, men two West one two men have to be more engaged in the changes. Uh, men most of most of the changes that we have have come because of the women's movement. Uh, and two, everyone has to be more self reflective, and this is one of the big things that in my practice in working with couples I absolutely focus on. Uh, I'm going to reach over here and get a. Uh, 
an article that I just read today. I'm going to mention it. Um, let's first work on the, the talk about current work issues. You know, it was been very interesting in the pandemic, which of course has occurred around the world. But people could start working at home. That made a huge difference for women. Just absolutely made a huge difference for women. Now, the CEOs of lots of the major corporations, like, for example, Zuckerberg and uh, heads of banks, are promoting a return to work movement. It's a big deal now in this country, anyway, about push, getting people to go back to work full time. Uh, their argument is that uh, the uh, it decreases if it, when you work away from home, even in hybrid situation, it decreases productivity, creative. It changes the off. You don't develop the office culture, and you're not going to get more. You're not going to be able to advance as quickly in your jobs if we don't resume working in offices. Women are very much against this. And I think they're going to start working. And I think women are going to work collectively to continue to, to fight for work from home or hybrid schedule, schedules that have made life that much better for them. And is it actually true what they say about um, working from home not being as productive? I think that we don't know. And that's what I was going to mention. There's, I just noticed it today. Uh, a, this is a Harvard Business Review article. And it's called Tension is Rising Around Remote Work. And what this fellow is doing is looking at the, saying a lot more research needs to be done, but he's clarifying what the issues you have to decide. Businesses and other and researchers who are psychological and sociological researchers have to stay looking at what is what are the issues before you just take one side or the other, which is happening now. And just dig your feet in. You have to do the research to look at what's the difference. What are are we, if you talk about productivity, what is productivity? What is creativity? What is advancement? And, And begin to examine that in more thoroughly. So we, the whole picture is out on that. But I, we are setting up this tension. There's a tension now and it's going to continue for a while. And uh, it's going to make a huge difference. It'll make a huge difference in family life in terms of, uh, of changing Jerry gender st- the gender structure of marriage that we've had, um, and along this line, just moving on. Uh, any other thoughts about that? About uh, no, I was just thinking like that's a huge, huge change, um, huge discussion. It's going to change a lot of lives, and you're absolutely right about like what even is productivity? What are you referring to? Um, all that kind of stuff. So, but before we get carried away, <laughs> right, right, we could go we off can, on that. We but could I'm go not, down not, this rabbit hole. Yeah, I'm but. not. I'm not knowledgeable enough to speak further than I already have. Um, let me just talk a little bit more about men having. It's the second thing that has to change if you're going to change gender stereotypes. Men have to step up, and I think that men have to take a a, a page from what women have done. What women did was work collectively. You know, in the 70s, 60s, 70s, uh, 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 the women movement began. And by the way, going back to people I admire and, and books I read, this the women of the, of the 70s, so that started this, they're just brilliant, just wonderful. They went out on a limb, you know, that vilified. So they're in my heart, too. Um but they so, and men have to take collective action if they want to change it. They get want to get serious about this, so that they can support taking parental leave. They can support talking about work and family and their families at work and work and family uh, balance in in their lives. And they can support other men who, if they do take per, uh, parental leave, get called wussies. So he. <laughs> <laughs> That's just not even a good word. No, it isn't. It, it, I could have said something even worse than that, but I'm not going to do that. This is a nice show. Uh, and, Thank you. Uh, we appreciate it, Catherine. Right. And uh, and then and then from there, when you start doing a collective uh, collective action, then in fact you can uh, make balance an elective election issue. But men cannot do this individually on their own in an office space. So they have to they have to get, uh, get start working collectively. And the third thing, if you're gonna if you can make change about anything in your life, and these are huge changes that we're talking about, you have to be self reflective because you have to be more self aware. 
if you're more self-aware, you have to be self. You have to learn to be self-reflective. There was a great discussion. I'm going back to the Harvard Business Review, which often writes really good things about relationships, uh, about the importance of self-reflection. It, the article was titled, "Let me read this: Why should you make time for self Why you should make time for self-reflection, even if you hate doing it." It was written by uh, Jennifer Porter, who was a managing partner of a leadership and a team development firm. Um, And here are her ideas. Let me talk to you briefly about her ideas. She said that at its simplest, reflection is about careful thought. But more important and what's really valuable is conscious consideration of what's going on in the events around you that that you're taking notice of. What are you reacting to? Pay attention to what you're reacting to. When you start reflecting like this, it gives your brain a chance to pause a minute the chaos that you're feeling of what's happening around you and the confusion that may be happening around you. You can begin to sort through the beliefs and the experiences that you're having. This allows you to look at things in various ways. You're not stuck in one perspective. And when you can look at things in a different way, then you can start thinking about things differently and you can start changing things. So I am a big promoter throughout everything I do of being able to be self-reflective. And it is, I think women do it sort of by training as part of that gendered role. I think men do it less frequently. And I, 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 this, I wrote a, uh, one of the posts that I wrote was on how important it is for men to be self-reflective. And I tried in that post to point out, not if you go and say how to be self-reflective, people give you this long, you got to make lists, you got to do this, you got you can't do that. But I gave him some clues as how when you start to get reactive, pay attention and what to do to be self-reflective then so that it's more when you're getting triggered by something, that's the time to be self-reflective. I'm not a big promoter of you've got to go on some course to learn to be self-reflective or start making lists or doing this or that or the other thing and take the time to do that because I don't think men will do that. That's a beautiful sentiment. And I think that that's not only going to benefit them in relationships, but also just their own personal growth. Absolutely. Absolutely. Self-reflection is about personal awareness, personal growth, and being able to understand yourself and not be reactive and get yourself in lots of trouble that you never had to be in. Yeah. And also just a lot of questioning what you do, why you do it. You know, is there a need to improve Stuff like that. Um, So how do these gendered expectations impact the power dynamics within relationships? Okay. When I think about power dynamics, because this is not a, this is not, it's not usually a way I think about things. I don't often think about things in a power, um, but, but, but so I kind of looked it up a little bit and saw what we're, what are people talking about it? Um, I think it's about what happens, people talk about it, it's about what happens to people when imbalances occur in relationships. And uh, those imbalances can turn into pretty negative patterns. And psychologists have done a lot of work on the uh, negative, rigid interaction patterns that people, that young, that married couples can um, can develop. And they've been identified, a couple that I want to point out that are really quite dreadful. And one, and very destructive for relationships. One's called demand withdrawal pattern, and the other is distancing and pursuing. And uh, wives, for example, are more likely to be demanders and pursuers. And I'll tell you about why in a minute. Uh, So it'll be like, do your fair share. Why don't you talk to me more? Tell me how you feel. You know, those are demand statements that there's some expectation that you respond. Uh, husbands will more likely be pursuers uh, for more frequent sex and probably more leisure time to attend to sports activities. Um, women, you know, go back to that that caring in the family. Women are responsible for the emotional well-being and caring of the entire family. Men are not, so they are. They are t- in tuned to those kinds of things that men typically are not attuned to. We've been trained to do that. I, you know, 
one of the important things to to know about this gender the 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 uh, during the rep, during the industrial revolution when women went into the houses and men went into the business world we got into different worlds and we don't do a good job we've got to do a better job of connecting those worlds i think so By the what way, might sorry yes uh, uh, John Gottman is a well-known and respected marital researcher, and he and his wife now have an active uh, in institute. And he well, he's done some marvelous research about this kind of demand, withdrawal kind of pattern. And he tells us about 80% of the time, it's wives who, who want change. Men are, are oftentimes pretty satisfied with the status quo uh, because they're less happy with what's going on and women men are more satisfied and uh, just by the way if people are interested in this john gottman's done some really great great kind of work and he has a description of four tactics that men use to resist change so, so the women are going to start to make change it's called stonewalling which is self-explanatory being defensive being criticizing you're so you're just nagging me Oh God, that just that just gave me wall flashbacks <laughs> <laughs> to like past relationships. <laughs> yeah. And contempt. And contempt is when you really show disdain for your spouse, for your wife. And that's just brutal. Just brutal. And if people are who are listening to us are interested, Gandhi, his work is readily available in books. He's written, he and his wife have written lots of books and it's readily available to go and explore those those tactics. Uh, it's very difficult to get outside of that pattern when you get into it on your own. You have to get outside. Um, now, um, you know, we're, we've gone through a lot of the stuff about gender uh, roles now, we've, and you've done a nice job of, of really framing some questions that helped me really think through this stuff, Marie. I, I was very appreciative of oh, that thank everything you. you put through. Um, and I'm beginning to think, you know, we have to start thinking when negative patterns show up, as they often do, like this demand withdrawal. And people go into therapy to get it, or they get divorced. I mean, people are getting divorced nowadays a lot. We have to start looking at changing the way marriage is structured pretty significantly, not trying to fix one couple at a time. Yeah, so. Yeah, that sounds like a great... Um philosophy to live by um what do you think might be a better model or dynamic of genders in a relationship well you, you want to get to the end of my i will come back and get some of the other stuff but i'm going to um i'm going to move to uh, offer you my new way of looking at things as a matter of fact i would suggest we start a, you and i could start a whole new era and it could be called <laughs> It could be called the collaborative era. Instead that would of be the, so iconic. Isn't that brilliant? Okay. Yes, it sounds so we amazing. Have, we've taken two major themes stand out when we look historically at um, marriage. Um, one is the separation with the Industrial Revolution, separated men and women into different silos of living. I love that concept of these different silos. Can you imagine these two different silos out in the field and men and it one is, and women another? It is a very vivid picture and it's it so is. accurate. Uh, and this, I think this view still holds in marriage, even though it's less true of public life. The uh, division, and that division also created... Um, the characteristic, the transactional nature of relationship now. Uh, and I and I'll, I may talk a little bit about something else in a minute, but, um, and the, and also there was another thing, the belief, the belief that was widely held now that our own, our primary or our only motivation is self-interest brought to us both by economic theory and evolutionary theory. And psychologists, and I really blame us as psychologists for this, who translated the notion of self-interest into psychological needs. So we don't have things we want to flourish in life. We have needs. And if you look at any of the popular literature, 
you will find all kinds of statements about if your needs aren't satisfied, you it's your right to be unhappy. Needs is really a very selfish way of looking at it. It's a demand. If I need something, you must provide it or I am going to be dissatisfied. If if I, for example, need sex and you don't provide it, I am justified in being being unhappy. I'm justified in behaving badly. I'm justified in all kinds of things. If you don't talk to me and don't provide me with the, emo- the emotional support I need in the relationship, I'm justified in all kinds of bad behaviors. The the need is a is a devastating way of thinking about what we want it because you cannot the only thing you can do is transact it the only thing you can do with needs is exchange them i'll give you sex if you talk to me more there's a i i mean i that was that's not just something i made up that would actually happen so for example in therapeutic encounters where people are trying to help people is to exchange stupid things like that which have no relevance for each other i mean that's not what you exchange. You know, you have sex and you negotiate that and you have conversation and you negotiate that. So I think we have to redefine marriage. Okay. This is, this is my big shot now. Okay. Um, relation, I want to, I want to define relationship and this is what my book is about. So if people want to know more, uh, more in depth about what I think they should read the book or, um, access the, uh, not the podcast, the blog, on psychology today um as a committed relationship that is not defined by gender one in part in which partners can simultaneously see themselves as an individual and a couple so in my relationship there's a tensional relationship between seeing myself as an individual but also seeing myself in relationship to my husband it's not something that we balance it's i have to keep those it's like a stereoscopic view I have to keep both those images of myself as an individual with my own wishes and wants and desires to flourish, but also as somebody who's in a relationship with somebody who has the same wishes and wants and desires. It's a stereoscopic view. And as a couple, you are willing to negotiate the things in life that allow you to flourish. And you do not define those things as needs. And, And if you'd like, I'll talk to you about what negotiating collaboratively looks like. Yeah, sure. Um, I just have to say first that I really like the way you reworded needs to wishes and wants and desires because uh, that's really more accurate as to what it really is. Um, And it also makes it feel a bit less like, oh, you're not doing enough. Like. like Excellent point. I other that, that's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. And I go in my own life and, and will uh, go even to a further degree. I, there are things I wish and want to flourish, but most of what I want in life is my preference. It's what I prefer. A hundred percent. It's not what I need. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So negotiation and negotiating collaboratively. This is the big deal. This is, this is the, this is the the end of this. <laughs> we can go back and I, I'll look over my notes and see if we can, can pick up any other kinds of things that you might like to talk about. But whether you're making plans, it doesn't matter whether they're career choices, where you live, day to day issues, who does what at the home, what kind of intimate life you're going to have, what you're going to have. There's a process that you can. So what do we do when these negative patterns show up in couples? OK, good question. Uh, that's what I spent my whole career trying to do. Uh, and I think uh, I've come to the conclusion now that uh, we have to do something more than try to treat this situation one couple at a time. And if you look at the status of marriage right now, it's it's not particularly good. Let me give you a few stats that will help us understand that we need to move on to something different. 35 to 50 percent of first marriages end in divorce. So the rate is higher for second and third marriage. First marriages today last about seven years. It used to be 40 years. Uh, some of that's happened, the, the, the increase in divorce because of dual earner, dual earner marriage. It's a contributing factor. 
But dual earner marriages don't look, as I've noted, said, they don't look much different than the traditional one. Women are still women are still doing most of the work. And the other thing that's happening in the society, um, Marie, that is we haven't talked enough about today is uh, men are not doing well. Uh, men are more t- likely to take their own lives. They're less likely to thrive after divorce unless they get remarried. They're less educated than women. Women are not interested in marrying, particularly men who cannot hold a job down. By the way, I want to mention briefly um, a fellow by the name of Richard Reeves. He works at the Brookings Institute, which is one of the wonderful think tanks here in the United States. He's been writing and researching about men and marriage for a number of years, and I've used him as a resource resource forever. And he's come out with a he's he's going on his own, I think, to develop an institute to study men and boys. And I trust his work. And he has a new book. It's called Of Boys and Men, Why Moder- the Modern Male is Struggling, Why It Matters, and What to Do About It. Um, and, and he's promising us that he's going to come up with what constitutes a healthy conception of manhood. So it's we need to do more than work it, with couples one step at a t- one uh, couple at a time to change things in therapy. And we also need to, men, we need to help men, or men need to be helped societally, not just leave them languishing. So um, we need to come up with a different concept of marriage, and I'd like to, to redefine, I'd like to think differently about marriage. I like to think about it as a committed relationship that's not defined by gender, in which partners can see themselves simultaneously as individuals and as a couple. It's like a stereoscopic view I can see myself, but I can also see myself in relationship to you, and I can see you as an individual and you in relationship to me. And you're willing to negotiate collaboratively, big deal there, negotiate collaboratively, the things in life that allow you to flourish as individuals, and those things that are important to you are not defined as needs. So uh, I'm, I'm ready to call for a new era uh, Marie, you can help me with this. We'll call it the collaborative era, and it's. Based- I'm so keen. That sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to. I wanted to go through now and talk about a little bit, a brief introduction to what negotiating collaboratively is about. The new way of being together. So whether you're making big plans or where to live, or what kind of career you want to have, and how you're going to make that work together. Uh, day-to-day wishes like who's going to do the dishes uh, and about the how you're going to be intimate with each other there is a process that you can follow to arrive at a resolution then this is the important thing that takes into account both of what you want Uh, and there are steps in this process and it's called negotiation let's take a brief look at what this is what this would be like the first thing you have to do if you have an issue to raise with your spouse or you want to bring up either a disagreement a difference or just some issue about life or the relationship take think things through take some time to think through what is important to you again that whole process of self-reflection approach your partner you've got to give your partner a heads up you can't just go and start talking to them about what you've been thinking about for six weeks they need the time to think through what is important to them they need that time for self-reflection then you and at that time you can when you're approaching your partner set up an appropriate time you know if it's like where what movie are we going to see tonight you do it in 10 minutes but if it's about who's going to do what I was going to have what career and next or what career moves next then you need a couple of weeks to give people time to think the next step is each of you being able to express what you want. This is where the self-expression of this era, the current era comes, which we need to move beyond. Uh, each of you wants to be able to express what you want. So you have, to, you have to think about it to know what you want to express and why it's important, not justifying it, but why it's important. What is its meaningfulness to you? Be cautious about trying, when you're doing this, expressing yourself, be cautious about trying to privilege yourself, your position, perhaps because you're a man or a woman or who makes the most money or who's the most logical. One of the really 
cool things when you express what you want and listen to your partner and vice versa. What you're demonstrating is that every concern of yours is a concern of mine. And this is a process by which you get to know your partner better. You could, we can always learn new things about our partner. And our partner gets to know us and then you work towards a solution, and it's a solution that considers both people's wants and wishes. Now, I'm going to give you just a brief example, and this is not a, not a startling example of a couple who's, who went through this process. It's not some major thing. It's just a minor thing, but I'm going to call the woman Sarah. Sarah was just home with a new baby. And so she's doing lots of error running and, and shopping and going to the doctor's office. And there's a parking garage right near where most of where she wants to go. She likes to park in the parking garage. Lucas, her husband, really doesn't like her parking in the garage. And um, he likes her. He, he doesn't he, he doesn't like that. So they they had this issue. So they said, made an appointment. Well, an appointment's a little strong, but they made a time to talk together. And they talked about why... Why was it important for Sarah to park in the garage? And why did Lucas not want her to park there? It was important for her to park in the garage because it was closest to where she wanted to be. It was easier to get the baby's carriages and things in and out of the car and going to where they were going. And she didn't like to be late. And she's been very busy with the baby. Lucas would, didn't want her to park in the garage because he was concerned about the car. The parking spaces are narrow. And doors, car doors next to you open and scratch the door. So expressing your concerns and listening, nobody, nobody's right or wrong here. Each of them have something that feels important to them. So how can you work this out and demonstrate that you have showed concern and not put the other persons down or privilege your position? It's more important that we don't spend money on getting the car scratched. That's the most important thing. Or no, it's more important that I get to where I'm going on the time that I want. So what they worked out was that Sarah would park on the, when she, when she had you'd used the car and was going to the to doctor's office, for example, she would park on the top level where there were fewer cars that would park. And when Lucas was home, he would drive her to where she wanted to go. So they were able to work out a solution that was somewhat complex, perhaps, but it took into account both that they want. It wasn't one privileging the other's positions. It was easily listening and honoring each other's positions, showing that every concern is your is a concern of your uh, every concern of yours is a concern of mine. Yeah, and, and that the, is a great example of collaborating. Abso absolutely. Because it's, yeah, it's not like oh well, this is your issue. This is your own concern. You think of the solution. It's like no, what can we do together <laughs> to make sure we're both comfortable with this? Right, and and I think I just absolutely I read that that every concern of yours is a concern of mine. It's not original with me, but I think it's just brilliant. I think it touches me every time I say it out loud. Let me end today with my. Not, yeah, I don't know where we're, I don't end the session, but let me finish a little bit where I am with talking about what being collaborative means. Collaborate, collaborate, collaborators are equal. They share authority. They negotiate in good faith. Collaboration is not cooperation. Collaboration is about the process of working together. Cooperation is about the result of working together. I can cooperate with you by letting you do what you want. Collaboration is not capitulation. Most of us have probably an unconscious fear of being overwhelmed or taken over by someone. So you have to pay attention to that because that's not what collaboration is. It's not capitulating just in the example. Nobody has to give up what they what is important to them. So if you find yourself feeling that when you're trying to work out, you have to step back and self-reflect. And, uh, and, and collaboration is not compromise. So often in the literature, when I read about, I mean, it's just rampant. Oh, you have to compromise. Compromise is like cooperation. You know, I can compromise by giving in to you what you want and then usually when that's going on 
you're giving in because of some personal reason, and that's going to come back. Collaboration is equals who share authority, who take the time to listen to each other and try to work something out that takes into account what both of you want. That's, that's what I think is should be our new era, the new era of collaboration in marriage. I love that so much. I think ev- like whatever you just said in the past, like 30 seconds, one minute has really blown my mind because I, yeah, I've heard the word compromise a lot in past relationships, like, oh, every relationship you need to compromise and, and stuff like that. And it's like, I never thought thought that it was particularly wrong before because it's also what a lot of people around me were saying but whatever you have said right now it makes so much more sense and it also creates a much safer environment for your relationship to flourish absolutely when uh, yeah it's not about like sacrificing here and there it's because compromise it sounds- typically means i'm yeah. giving something up yeah and then I don't want it, something it, up. it does sound a lot more safe sad (laughs) and like why would you like yeah so collaborative era i'm so for this Uh, it's going to be a thing i'm all for it i'm going to spread the word wonderful wonderful Uh, on this side of the world i'll spread the word for you that's brilliant (laughs) i love it i love it so what are some misconceptions about gendered expectations in relationships uh let me see where i am uh Oh, let me get my notes about that. I like to speak from notes. Yeah, take your time. Okay, just let me give a minute to get, uh, what would I do with that? Oh, here, I got to put it up here so I can remember it. Um, Okay, this is where I talk a little bit about masculinity and femininity. I think for me, the the biggest misconception is gender roles in relationships are the natural order. What I think this is, because there's innate, unmodifiable differences between men and women. What that refuses to take into account is the history of being separated into different silos of experience, which then sets up a positive reinforcement. The more I live at home and are responsible of taking care of things, the more caring I become. The more caring I become, the more you see me as caring. So the whole idea of having these masculine and feminine traits gets more entrenched, and we need to understand where that began. So it's just, uh, it's, a, it's more historically grounded, I believe, than my biologically grounded. So, um, and the, as I mentioned earlier, it was very interesting to me to learn, this was new for me, I did not really know this, that the idea of mass, being masculine and feminine came along with the uh, with the Industrial Revolution, because when you start separating people, you have to have a way of characterizing them. The way we characterize men and women is by calling them masculine and feminine. And during this companionate era, so- psychologists, of course, started studying masculine and feminine traits, right? How many questionnaires have you answered about which of these traits do you, are true for you? Uh, and men are always have the traits of strength, power, competitiveness, courage, leadership, independence. Women are emotional. They're accommodating. They're passive. They're nurturing. And above all, we're virtuous. We have virtue sign col- uh, collected. Um, we have come to think about men and women as distinct categories, the most prominent view of that is men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And I just want to mention in terms of these misconceptions, there's a couple of psychologists by the name of Carruthers and Reese who published their research in a paper entitled Men and Women Are from Earth. And they they took a look at 13 different studies that had shown significant, let me tell you, different uh, gender difference in such traits that we just talked about. They also looked at physical characteristics and they also looked at personal interests, such whether you like scrapbooking or boxing. And they found sex differences in physical attributes. Men are generally taller than women, although it's there, you know, it's just average difference. It's not, we know that each man, no man, not every man is taller than every woman. Um, And, and, um, 
their interests were different. Women like scrapbooking and men like boxing. Traits were different. The overlap between these traditionally defined masculine and feminine traits was so big, they could not de- separate men and women into categories based on those traits. So it's it's one of those, it's not that there are no differences between men and women, but they are not to the degree, nor do we need to characterize and reinforce that and overemphasize by characterizing men as masculine and women in terms of masculine traits. I think a better notion would be like what Richard Reeves is trying to do. What is manhood about? Rather than, and, and the, you know, when we, it, it would be a better way if we could just stop really, you know, and nowadays we have this crisis of masculinity, you know, and so it's just, it would be very helpful if we could not focus so much on masculine traits or feminine traits, but what is manhood? What is it like being a man? And pay attention to that and take seriously the men in our lives. What is going on with men and how can things be better for them? And then how can they be better partners for us in terms of a collaborative marriage or a collaborative relationship? Exactly. I agree with a lot of what you said. And I feel like a a lot of the traits, the masculine versus feminine traits, a lot of them are very subjective. Like, I, I, well, this is a personal opinion, I feel like, but I think it takes courage to be emotional and to be openly vulnerable and vice versa like it's just a lot of these traits are very subjective so it's it it's not just well this is masculine this is feminine and this is what all men are and these are what this this is what all women are um i feel like a lot of them are part of every human being out there absolutely it's just to what degree it's it is to what degree and it is what you think that how the, how you think that defines you? Those differences do not necessarily define who you are as a person. They are they are attributes of yours, but they don't define who you are. But when we talk about masculine men, we're defining men, we're defining women, and we have to stop doing that. We we can be people first and foremost, and it's uh, you know it, and when you when you think about roles in marriage and you think about marriage you're 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 putting you know your your spouse or the person you're in a relationship with is a person they're not a category they're a human being and they have to be treated as an individual and respected and valued and loved as an individual with whom you can collaborate and negotiate the things in life that are important to do exactly i agree with you there um so jumping off that point how does a relationship benefit from challenging and redefining these stereotypes? Well, uh, I think that it's sort of embedded in sort of what I've already said. I think relationships I, can flourish. I think people can flourish. Relationships can flourish. And we are better off together. I don't mean that. I'm not going to say that as a blanket statement. Being alone and being on your own is is a perfectly wonderful way to be, too. But we are, I believe we are social animals, or I don't even call us animals. We're social people, and we, and relationships are wonderful. I've been married a very long time, and while my experience is only my experience, it is, it has been a tough, hard, difficult not a marriage, but hard and difficult at times. And we, and the fact that we've worked through this and come to where we are today has made us both better people as individuals. I think being together allows you to become a better person as an individual. And I think it real. and I do think that, uh, and I'm not rigid about this, but I think uh, living together and being with families and with children is is a desirable thing. It's not the only desirable thing, but there is value in it. Yeah, that's a very, very nice sentiment. Um, for couples who 
Well, societal pressures are inevitable, external influences and everything. So how can couples navigate these when I, you know, attempting? It's like, it's like anything else. It's like with the feminist movement or if men want to change, if you want to protect yourself, then in fact you end up becoming working in a collective fashion so you work with other people you meet with other people you talk with other you pe- and you and you learn how when people treat you badly or say bad things to you how to frame a response that is neither uh disdainful or disrespectful but stands up for what you say you know, for example, you say, I under, I understand that that is the way you see things. You know, I, that's not how I see them. I used to teach my clients that all the time in terms of conflict within marriages or conflict between people. If somebody says something to you that is harmful, hurtful, or that you disagree with, you give the person their position. Do not try to argue with them. Give the person their position and then separate yourself from that position. I understand. It's not that you say, I understand what you're saying, because you may not understand it. I understand that that's how you see things. But you give them their position. I understand that's how you see things. I see things differently. And if no matter what happens and the, you know, the, the conflict continues, at some point you simply have to say something to the effect of, I have nothing more to add, and you leave the field. You do not, you're not obligated to stay in that kind of relationship. And again, I think if you really want to change gender issues, then be be active. Be active in groups. Be active politically. I don't think we change much about the world or about society as an individual. I think it's very difficult to make large changes as an individual. I think you have to do it collectively. Mm-hmm. That is true. That is very, very true. Um, so what are some things that listeners can do to challenge gendered expectations in relationships? Read my book, read my podcast, Fantastic. really, because it's just, I mean, I, and really that's what we've been talking about all the time is really recognizing, do your own thinking about it, make sure you buy into what you're saying, what I'm saying, make sure you buy into this, you have to buy into it. And then if you buy into it, uh, Begin to be self-reflective about who you are, where you are, and what you want to be different, and then plan how to make it different and get some help doing that. That was great, Catherine. Thank you for answering all of my questions. Now we're moving on to the open mic, and this is your opportunity to talk about anything that you're passionate about. You have the floor. Oh, my goodness. Um well, uh, kind of in keeping with what we've been doing, because that's where my head is, right, and has been, in fact, for a couple of weeks planning to try to talk to people about this, is uh, uh, relationships are really, really worthwhile making the effort to be in uh, whatever form they take for you. Mine has been a marriage and it's been a longstanding marriage, and Joe and I have been through the whole effort of changing our relationships. Uh, I will tell you a little story. Uh, I had gotten very active in the um, women's movement and decided, uh, uh, and I decided, and he agrees with me that I was as smart as my husband was, who was just finishing graduate school in psychology. And um, he was moving on to his first job, a very nice job in North Carolina at the University of North Carolina. And I decided that I wanted to go to graduate school in psychology. And so I said to him that I had to have the same opportunity that he did to enter a number of graduate schools. The only graduate schools that were around where we were living were uh, very prestigious universities or, and and I was not gonna be, it was not acceptable for me to try to enroll in the University of North Carolina, which is where he worked because of nepotism. and uh, the other one was the other school nearby was about an hour and a half away. So I said to him, uh, you know, I'd, uh, after c- due consideration and then giving him some time to think about it, that I felt that I had to have the same opportunity to go to graduate school that he did. Therefore, I had to be able to apply to a number of graduate schools, and that would have implications for him because he had just started this job. It was a great job. 
And uh, I went away on a trip for a week and came back. And so he had plenty of time to think through it. And he agreed. He said, you have to have the right to do that. And so I applied to a number of schools, including the ones nearby. And at the time when that happened, Joe had to let the people know that he was going to at his work at the University of North Carolina Department of Psychiatry that um, he was going to do this. And the wife of the woman who it, tried to help hire Joe to come to this job came to visit me once and she said to me, Catherine, you're going to lose him. And if you do this and, uh, you know, I, that, that is the epitome of trying to step out of a gender role and what happens. The outcome of that was I got accepted to the very prestigious university that was only 10 miles away. So Joe kept his job and I got the degree and we've lived happily ever after. Oh, but... that It's stories like yours that gives me hope. <laughs> <laughs> there are wonderful, there are wonderful men and there are wonderful women out there. We can do this. We can collaborate. We can live collaboratively. This is actually such a touching story that I fear I might be tearing up at any moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't tell you anymore. <laughs> He, he I, is a wonderful yeah. person who has always supported me in for in everything I have done. That's so um, comforting to hear amidst a lot of just wrong goings in the in the world. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Catherine, for you're joining very, us today. Thank you for having me. Um, if you're if our listeners want to find out more about you and what you do, where can they go? I think the best thing to do is is to uh, go to my, um, I'll give you the uh, thing if you like it. Let me see if I can find it here. The um, post, the psychology, the blog to in Psychology Today. Psychology uh, Today, yeah. Yeah, and here is, uh, you can, if you go to Psychology Today and you just plug in my name, you can find it. But if you'd like, I can give you the URL. Shall I give you that? Uh, we or can not. link it in the show notes. Okay. I, okay. Yeah, we can I link think it you in have the that notes. information. And then All I right, would just perfect. suggest you read my book. Um, I I'm, I know I'm selling it, but it's it is it is everything I've said today in more detail. And then the the blog has allowed me to keep current and to update a lots of the ideas. So if you want to know me, that's the best way to know me is through my work. That's amazing. So. If our listeners want to find out more about you and what you do, um, they can grab Catherine's book or they can look at the article from Psychology Today that we will link in, in the show notes. And I'm also on Facebook under Catherine Aponte too. I'm very happy to have people look at that. To know or you can, yeah, or you can look her up on Facebook. <laughs> Thank you everyone for tuning in and we will catch you in the next episode. You've been listening to Veloscope, the Relationship Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Live Management Science Labs. For more episodes like this from 10 different life management perspectives, search LMSL on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts so you can get updated on everything we have to offer. We have a wide range of topics readily available for you to check out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it and subscribing to our channel as it helps us grow and bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at re.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Marie Stella. Thanks for tuning in.